Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Scotia iTrades webinars. Today's topic is on best practices in ETF trading with Horizons ETFs. Let's do a quick audio test before we get started. If you can hear me clearly and the sound quality is great, please click on that hand icon in your toolbar. Thank you. And also, if you are experiencing some audio difficulties, you can click on that sound check link in your audio panel to test your audio, and the setup window may show up on your secondary screen. As always, everyone is muted for sound quality purposes. And if you did join us by telephone, please don't forget to enter the PIN number and the access code. And just as a reminder that Scotia iTrade does not provide investment or tax advice or recommendations, and nothing in this presentation is or should be construed as investment or tax advice or recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security or to follow any particular investment strategy. Today's presentation, as with all of our presentations, is strictly for educational purposes only. So you did get a chance to use this toolbar. As you see there, there is an arrow icon. This really allows you to show or hide the control panel. Sometimes you'll notice that the control panel may uh, cover some of the wording or the comments in the screen, so feel free to just move that along uh, on your monitor so that it's not blocking any of the content. Also, you may use the full screen icon to view in full screen mode and the hand icon if you have any questions. And as always, you can type in your questions in the Q&A panel or questions panel, and the presenter will address them as they come in or at the end of the session. We are recording today's session, and if you did select yes on the registration page, we will email you the recording. Alternatively, you can access our past webinars on our Webinars on Demand page under the Learn and Do More section of scotiaitrade.com. You are also welcome to take notes, however, while we'll Mill make today's presentation available for you to download at the end of the session. Please note that the handout won't be available until the end of the session, and you can download it from the handouts panel as you see right there. And today's session is part of a learning series from Horizons ETFs. Best practices in ETF trading falls under the series two strategies using ETFs. And you ha if you haven't had a chance to view any of the past uh, webinars as you see here in series one, you may do so by accessing them from our webinars on demand section. And our presenter today is Jamie Purvis. As Executive Vice President, he includes, includes among his responsibilities the development and delivery of strategy and content in the self-directed investor channel. Additionally, he leads the educational campaigns for Horizons, such as the highly acclaimed Horizons ETF University series, and is a frequent speaker and panelist at industry events and commentator in the press. A Queen's University graduate with an honors degree in political science, Jamie was involved in the original development of Horizons ETFs and has been with it and predecessor firms since 1995. Jamie represents Horizons ETFs on the Alternative Investment Management Association, the Global Organization for Alternative Investment Operations and Management, and is the past chair of the Canadian Retail Sales Practices Committee. Welcome, Jamie. Let me just unmute you there. Thank you, Rose. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, Rose, I'm, I'm going to take it that you can hear me. I'm connected to audio, and it says that Jamie Purvis is talking, so thank you. Uh, here comes my, my presentation up here, best practices in ETF trading. And I'll read it. I will say that, uh, as usual, it is a pleasure to be here with our friends at Scotia I Trade the second Tuesday of each month. Uh, the, our topic today, as you saw in the progression of uh, from beginner through intermediate to advanced presentations, this is the first of the intermediate sessions. This is called Best Practices in ETF Trading. And uh, before I get started, I do want to uh, iterate from the Horizon's perspective, much as uh, Scotia iTrade did, that this presentation is designed uh, and this session is, is, is sheerly for educational purposes and is not uh, to be taken as any uh, measure of, of advice on uh, how to run your portfolios. This is uh, an idea, ideas about execution, and really we're we're going to focus on something called the market maker. So um, I'm going to move along the slides here, uh, but very quickly, uh, our Horizons ETFs. Uh, really, when people look at our the trading uh, of ETFs, uh, happens to largely be on the self-directed channel in the Beta Pro segment, uh, which is not what we're talking about today. But uh, this is typically of, of great interest to uh, self-directed investors. Um, has an AUM of just shy of a billion dollars in net sales in 2016 year date of, of a quarter of a billion dollars. Keep in mind that these assets tend to increase with rising volatility. So we have seen a little rise in volatility this year, although we are still at what would have to be described as historical lows. Uh, 
somewhere between 18 and 22 percent, and we've seen uh, an average this year of 11 or 12 percent. So it has been a low volatile environment, and really, with a few exceptions, has been low volatile for quite a while since uh, quantitative easing has, has been in place. But uh, that being neither here nor there, uh, what we're going to talk about today is, as always, we start off with what is an ETF. So if, if you've been with our sessions before and you feel this is redundant, apologies. But this is really key uh, to everyone. I mean, we do get a lot of questions about what is an EFT. And we say, well, that's an electronic funds transfer. So we will clarify what is an ETF. Talk about some of the benefits of ETF investing, really. And as you know, this is why there's such a great partnership between uh, Horizons and, and Scotia iTrade, is that Scotia iTrade offer you low-cost execution, and Horizons offer you low-cost uh, tools to execute on the Scotia iTrade platform. Then the bulk of what we'll talk about will be the third segment, which is the ETF mechanics and the market making process. And this is so you understand how the bid ask works. And you can see how you can get that best execution when you're making your trades. I will give a few trading tips. And these are not tips in terms of what to buy, but what to look for when you're buying and some of the things you need to be aware of when trading ETFs. Uh, and that sort of segues into the last section, key consideration when buying or selling ETFs. So what is an ETF? Well, really, it's a best of stocks and mutual funds. Uh, an ETF is an exchange-listed security that trades on an exchange like a stock and has its own ticker symbol. Um, but similar to a mutual fund, an ETF typically holds a portfolio of securities. It doesn't represent one company. It shows a, a whole portfolio of companies and is what's called an open-ended investment trust, meaning that new units of ETF can be issued by the ETF company at any time to meet demand with no impact on the net asset value. So that's very different. That's a, like a mutual fund does the same thing, right? You execute at the mutual fund cost. ETF you execute very close to or at the, the value of, of the unit. But a stock is very different because there's a limited number of shares issued. So whereas supply and demand, as we all know from our economics 101, that the, if supply is fixed and demand goes up, the price of the good or the security goes up. And if supply is fixed and the demand goes down, then the price goes down. With a mutual fund or ETF, they're always designed to reflect the actual value of the underlying stocks that make up the portfolio. Now, you would make a very good point saying, well, those stocks aren't, uh, aren't necessarily perfectly valued, and that's the whole point of investing in the stock market. You're right. Uh, most people, when they buy a stock, think that it's undervalued, and they're waiting, they want it to go up to its regular value, or what they, what they think or have assessed is the proper value, or even above, before they're going to sell, or they're going to hold it for a long time because of the dividend. But ETFs and mutual funds execute at the value. Stocks can, but for the most part, uh, I think the, the, the numbers would, would indicate that they don't. So the key features of ETFs, well, one is that they offer that intraday liquidity that we talked about. And this is unlike a mutual fund. So this is one of the points of differentiation from a mutual fund. The ETFs can be bought and sold throughout the day because of this market maker. And we're going to talk about them uh, for, for quite a bit today. ETFs are transparent in that their holdings are published on a frequent basis. Uh, most, no, sorry, that's not fair to say. Many ETFs now are based upon an index, and certainly the, the origins of the ETF were to track a large cap index, so the S&P 500, the TSX 60. Uh, of course, well, you know the constituents and the weights in those cases. But even active ETFs and, and the smart beta ETFs show a lot of their portfolio holdings on a much more regular basis than mutual funds. Mutual funds actually show their holdings under the 81, National Instrument 81102, which regulates uh, mutual funds. They show their holdings on the last day of each uh, six-month period, but they show them 90 days later. With an ETF, uh, if it's an index, you know exactly what the constituents are, or if it's an active uh, ETF, you typically see uh, that transparency is monthly. In terms of tax efficiency, what we're saying is that ETFs, if an ETF and a mutual fund hold the same things, ETFs typically are more tax efficient. Uh, for one reason, would be in the index ETFs is that they have lower turnover. Indexes change not to change, tend not to change too much over time, although there are always changes, uh, or, or there are regularly changes. Always is probably a strong word. The other process, the other factor that makes ETFs uh, tax efficient compared to a uh, mutual fund that does the same thing is what we call the net redemption process meaning that when you buy a mutual fund unit, it's created for you. When you sell it, that, you sell that back and they give you the money and that dest they destroy the unit, they sell the stock. The next day someone comes along and gives them the money back, gives them, the, let's say, the $100 that you redeemed, they're buying the stocks again. Those create deemed dispositions and those are taxable liabilities within a mutual fund. With an ETF, you 
uh, each company creates it, sells it to the market maker, or the market maker creates it with the ETF company. The market maker then sells all their units. Maybe they have a million units. They sell those out in the marketplace. And when they run out of units, they come to us and they create more, and then they sell those in the marketplace. But if they start getting, uh, they start buying them back because no one else wants to buy them, they can hold them for a period of time. And that period of time could be one day, it could be 10 years, uh, in anticipation, anticipation of selling that unit again. So what that means is that with a mutual fund, that your unit that you buy is created for you and destroyed after you're done with it. With an ETF, that unit that's created for the market maker can be bought and sold five times, 50 times, 500 times, 5,000 times before it's redeemed. It's not necessarily the case, but it uh, typically sees uh, greater utility having one or more owners. Um, so that reduces that net redemption process, which means less taxable liability within the portfolio. That's why we say ETFs are tax efficient. And finally, and this is the big one, of course, that most people are, are uh, familiar with, uh, is that ETFs are low cost. And they, they, ETF fees are traditionally lower than their mutual fund counterparts. Uh, I can tell you that we've got an ETF that uh, is, a, is run for us that is also run as a mutual fund by a different company. And our ETF's management fee is 0.8%. And the management fee uh, of this mutual fund that does the, essentially the exact same thing is about 2.4%. So it's three times the cost. So keeping that money in your pocket is important, and you as investors recognize that that's why you're at Scotia I trade, and that's why you're looking at ETF. So here's how the mutual fund works. I really, I really uh, sort of talked about this already. Let me just see if I can move this bar again quickly. Okay, there we go. Uh, that you have a buyer that goes to the fund company. The fund company then goes to the stock exchange to create the units that the buyer wants. And then when the seller when comes in, they also sell to the fund company, who then has to go sell the stocks on the stock exchange to get the cash to pay the seller the money they own. Uh, this is the graphic description of what I just told you on the previous slide. And now we'll go to uh, an ETF, and this is really what happens in ETF, and, and I talked about the initial creation of units, is that the ETF company, which is over here on the far right, uh, the broker or the market maker comes in and gives us $100 for the initial subscription. We deliver them the units of the ETF, so let's say $10 a unit, that's 10 units. They then, whatever they uh, they hold in inventory, so the, the market makers are not taking risk here, they hold that $100 of units of what make up the ETFs. Let's say here it's a TSX 60. And on the other side, they're short $100 of the same stocks that make up the TSX 60. So they are what is called position neutral. So they're not taking risk here uh, in terms of owning, uh, holding the units of our ETFs. In fact, it's not impacting the market at all because the market is long the $100 worth of stocks through the, the ETFs that the, the broker is holding, and it's short the $100 of stocks through the broker's hedge. So it has a, a net zero impact uh, on the market. That's day one of how units are created. Now, stay with me here because I, I always think that this is a, a bit of a complicated slide, but it's really important to understand that the only people that can create or redeem ETF units directly with the ETF company are these market makers also known as authorized participants or AB or designated broker. It's actually, you can have multiple market makers on an ETF, but every ETF has to have a designated broker, which is the lead market maker. They're contractually obligated to be there on the bid and ask, meaning they have stocks to sell or they're willing to buy from anyone in the market uh, to a certain degree given uh, market circumstances. So what happens here in step one is that the market maker uh, delivers the prescribed batch of security, so let's say you keep the TSX 60 to keep it easy, the 60 stocks that make up the 60 in the right ratio to the ETF fund manager. We in return deliver that, or they can do it in cash to the ETF uh, uh, fund manager who creates the units and gives them back to the authorized participant or slash broker here at the, at the bottom in the blue. Step three is that then the broker goes to the exchange and offers those units for sale or correspondingly will buy them uh, on the exchange. Then we see step four is the trading actually occurs when investors, that's you, buy and sell the ETF units from each other or from the authorized participant, right? And it's important to note that you could just be buying any units of an ETF from any other investor out there. You're not necessarily buying from the uh, authorized participant or market maker. The market maker's job is simply to be there all the time with a certain, we'll, we'll say goalpost, and I'll, I'll show you how those goalposts work in a few more slides. But let's say that the unit is worth $10. There will be 
too. That's how they make money, and that's your cost of doing business on the exchange. But there could be many other participants in the market willing to buy it from you for $9.99 or even $10 or sell it to you for $10 or $10.01. So that's the beauty of an ETF, uh, how they trade, on, and this part is called the secondary market, is that the market maker is there with goalposts, but most, the majority of trading in ETFs happens within those goalposts. So really, what is, who are these market makers? And they are what we call the pillars of the ETF ecosystem. Uh, they are third-party institutional traders. In the case of Canada, uh, almost every, in fact, every Canadian bank has a market-making unit uh, that don't necessarily work with all the ETF providers that exist, but they all have market-making uh, units. That, and those guys, those units, perform most of the ETF unit creation, redemption, and order taking on behalf of the ETF providers and their investors. So they're the conduit between you, the investor, and us, Horizons, the ETF company. And as I mentioned before, at least one market maker has a contractual obligation to the ETF provider, and they're known as the authorized participant or designated broker. These market makers are legally obligated to ensure, to the best of their ability, that an ETF has liquidity and trades efficiently. So the market makers are your friends. And the market makers will attempt, uh, for every second of every trading day, to ensure that an ETF trades as close to its net asset value, the NAV, I think we're all familiar with that phrase, if we've ever owned a mutual fund, we've seen that in our statement minus a small bid-out spread, which covers transactional costs and their profit. So, how does this, how do they determine the bid-offer price? Well, what we see here is they'll start over on the left as we have the underlying securities, right there, which turn into the ETF. That feeds to the market makers program, so they're looking at the, at the price of, of every stock, as I say, that, again, the TSX 60, the 60 stocks, they're looking at the price of those as they change every second of every day, at which point they're calculating what the real-time net asset value is, rather than calculating just once at the end of the, of the day at 4 o'clock like a mutual fund, our market makers are calculating that every second. And then that their program, so this is all computerized, this is not one guy with an abacus or someone counting on their fingers, this is the, the beauty of what technology allows us to do in uh, the investing space, that they then do the NAV, where the sell minus a spread, or they'll buy plus a spread. That's the bid and the offer, okay? So as the value of that underlying index changes, the bid offer of the ETF changes, but ideally the distance or the gap or the spread between the bid and the offer remains the same. So you can think of it as, as a, a couple of brackets following a line saying here's the, the best case scenario that you can sell at and the best case scenario, or, or sorry, the worst case scenario that you can buy at and the worst case scenario you can sell at, which is using the example I looked at before, could be two cents. So a ten dollar unit, the worst case you're gonna sell it for is nine ninety eight, and the best case you're gonna buy it, or the worst case you're gonna sell it buy it for is ten oh two. And then of course the bid offer spread and size of that how many units they have and how wide that gap is, is it four cents, is it six cents, is it two cents? Is dependent on the spread and liquidity of the underlying. So I'm gonna talk about that in, in a, a couple of slides that's really important. Obviously if we think about it, something like bonds have less liquidity, don't trade on the open market, they're going to have a wider bid-ask spread than, uh, say, large-cap equities. Small-cap equities might have a much larger spread because they're much more illiquid than the large-cap stocks. So it's really important, and this is why you see in ETFs, you don't see you know, Guatemalan bonds or uh, exclusively micro-cap stocks. There's just not enough liquidity in the underlying for the market makers to be able to provide a fair bid-ask price. Uh, and size. So if you look at something like the TSX 60, it's it's huge. Uh, so you know that you can transact 100,000 units in the blink of an eye at $30 a unit. So you can transact very huge amounts very simply. Um, but something like uh, Cana you know you, uh, Canadian high yield bonds would have a wider spread because there's not as much liquidity, um, both in terms of the scale of the market and in terms of how well the, those bonds trade versus the TSX 60. So the bigger and more liquid the underlying is of the ETF, the better the bid-ask spread typically. So this sort of revert, goes back to look at what the, the market making, the hedge execution. This is what the, the market makers are doing every day that they're charging you the penny of trade for, is that the underlying uh, well, let's start with the investor. The program 
in the program because we're talking about the computer runs the best, right? There's people watching those spreads and the programs at all times, but the program simultaneously selling the underlying stock uh, as the investor sells the ETF to the market maker. So if you are redeemed, you're selling your uh, TSX 60 ETF, the market maker is buying it from you, they are simultaneously uh, selling the same stocks out into the market. And then look, this is why liquidity in the market is key, because they're able to do that. Uh, when it comes back, when you uh, buy an ETF from the market maker, they're out there buying the stocks for you, the 60 stocks in the right ratio and the right amount uh, to create ETFs for you if they don't have the inventory already on hand. Right? In which case, if they do have the inventory on hand, they're just reducing the, the amount that they uh, are that of this underlying stocks at the size of the hedge that I referred to in slide one. So I know this process is, it seems a little bit complicated, but what it means is the market maker is always staying position neutral by selling the stocks or buying the stocks when you, the ETF investor, is buying the ETF or selling the ETF. So they stay position neutral, and that allows you to execute uh, at the price or at the value that you want. So I think this is a really important um, If we look at this, this is where I talked about the, the, how the bid ask spread works. So let's say that this blue area is the underlying bid offer spread. And that means of the underlying stocks or bonds or both that make up the portfolio. So something like the TSX 60 is going to have a one cent spread in their maximum because those stocks are very, very liquid and they trade uh, in high volumes all day long. But something like Canadian high yield bonds don't trade as much, they're not as liquid, and thus the spread is wider because you have to go find different quotes, you have to move blocks, uh, sometimes in a, in, a, in a fixed income market, some of the names in an index have no liquidity. The people that are holding those bonds have no interest in selling them because they really like them. So you're, the, the market maker is going to have to find, not the market maker, the ETF provider will go and find uh, some other fixed income offerings in that same category that approximate uh, that bond. And that's why you see a bigger uh, bid ask spread in fixed income. And it's well why you see a little more trading slippage because sometimes there's not the liquidity that you want. Then there's the trading cost. And this is everything that trades on any exchange has a trading cost. And that trading cost could be half a cent to one, per, one cent. Uh, typically uh, on the lower end for uh, higher liquidity products and on the, sorry, on the lower end for high liquidity products and on the higher end of cost towards that one cent for lower liquidity, so you say that's mid cap names. Um, the exchange always gets their pound of flesh. That's how they stay in business. That's how they provide all the data. Uh, that's how they do, do all of the all of the work that creates the underlying indexes. And then the market maker is making their money, which it could be half a cent to a cent. Uh, I will tell you that that number could be a lot lower. Uh, the market makers are uh, always competing with it, with each other to pick up fractions of a cent. And I'm sure you've heard of the high frequency traders. Uh, Michael Lewis has written a lot about them. Um, and how they work in terms of picking off spreads and, and picking up minute cents in the stock market. When the ETF business, uh, we like them because they trade, they tend to trade within these wide goalposts that you see at the far end of the market maker spread. They trade within that because their spread will be uh, you know, 0.1 of a cent or 0.05 of a cent. So that makes the market makers more competitive and that makes it better for you. So that is really the understanding the bid offer spread and that's why you see things uh, bid offer spread. In this case, we look at it as a three cent spread. And when you add it all up at the, the lowest possible cost, uh, and obviously I just said that could be lower, but in this case, we're talking three cents on equities versus fixed income might be more like the bottom line here where it's nine cents. One plus one plus five plus one plus one. So that's why you see different spreads on different ETFs. You say, hey, wait, this ETF seems to be trading really close, and this ETF seems to be broad. Well, that is typically because they do different things. And if you look at an ETF, two ETFs that track the same index, uh, you, you, you know there are several ETFs in Canada that tra track the S&P 500. Well, one of the things that will determine uh, that cost to you is what's the, the, the value of the unit. Uh, one unit of the S&P 500 might be trading for $50, while the other is trading for 10. So if you're paying three cents for the, every $10 unit that you uh, trade versus three cents for every $50 unit that you trade, well, Spending the three cents on the fifty-dollar unit makes better economic sense uh, from a trade cost perspective. So these are important things to keep in mind. Of course, uh, you know those two ETFs could have different fees. 
you, what you have to weigh in is say, you know, how much money do I have to invest here? What's the bid ask spread? And how does that measure up versus the fee? Something with a, you may be paying much less for the fifty dollar uh, unit of S and P five hundred, but it could be higher price in terms of what its management fee is uh, versus the ten dollar unit, which has a smaller management fee but a higher per unit trading cost. So these are the things that you may want to think about when you're uh, executing your trades. So this is this is the, really I've talked a little bit about the ETF economics, but these are the important considerations, and they're worth revisiting. The size of the bid to offer spread is dependent on the liquidity of the underlying. That means the better the liquidity in the underlying uh, securities, uh, the tighter the bid ask spread will be. And so here's an example of what the, what the tightest markets in the world are are actually currencies. The global currency markets are the largest in the in uh, largest markets available in the world. Uh, you know, globally trillions of dollars transact every day. So if you're in something that trades currencies, your transaction costs, your bid offer is typically going to be as low as, as you can possibly imagine. So the greater liquidity, the tighter the spread. And you know, market making, the market makers, as I showed you in the previous thing, are making a tenth of a cent or a half a cent, or a, when, you know, when it's really expensive, they're making a cent per unit. So it's a low margin, high volume business. And the greater the number of market makers and um, uh, high frequency traders included in that, the tighter the spread between the bid and ask. The order size that's shown on your screen is actually only a fraction of the size that can be executed. You know, on the TSX 60, uh, we may be showing 100,000 units on the on the bid ask, but they're they're obviously because of the liquidity of the index, there could be hundreds more, hundreds of thousands of more shares available there at that same bid ask number. Uh, so the order size that you see on your screen, when you say, oh, okay, what's what's the bid ask spread? Uh, could be you say, oh, there's only 100, there's 100,000 shares available right now. If you look at the second screen or how, how liquid that market is, it can tell you they can execute a far larger trade than that. So, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a couple of slides. Um, typically, ETFs trade very close to NAV with no supply demand constraints as the market makers can subscribe and redeem units daily. Talked about that earlier, but that's really, really important. Uh, and it is important to be aware of trading the hours of the underlying. For example, some of you may like trading gold. Uh, gold ETFs is a, is a nice way to trade the price of gold rather than owning it and putting it in your basement in a, in a safe and a hidden room, having a gun and a dog and an electric fence around your house. That's a, you know, the beauty of having a gold ETF is that you don't have to do all of that. You just benefit from the price change. But gold as a, as a market itself, the physical bullion market, prices from, I believe, 8.15 to 1.30 in the afternoon. So if you're trading, when you're trading at 9.30 or 9.45, let's say, you're getting the price of gold that's moved in the first hour and a 15 minutes already. So you're going to see some variation there. And of course, when gold stops trading at 1.30, the TSX is still open for another two and a half hours. So the bid ask spread then will widen out because the price of bullion is not changing, but the market is always changing. Something could be happening in Russia that's making people a little bit scared, or the, you know someone could have spoken at the Fed that makes everyone worried that interest rates are going up. Right? So it's just for a certain small group of, of ETFs that, that trade that mostly commodities that uh, have different trading hours than the equity-based and fixed income-based ETF. So this is a quick peek at what a market order book looks like. See, this is uh, you can see this on your screen when you go to Scotia I Trade. You can see all these different uh, brokers. So that you know, 80 uh, could be National Bank, and nine could be Scotia, and seven could be CIBC. I'm not saying those are the numbers. I'm just saying every every broker dealer has its own number. And so Scotia is willing to buy, or sorry, dealer 80 is willing to buy 10,000 shares from you at 998. And they're also willing to sell you 10,000 shares at 1001. So that's that spread, that's that three cent spread that we talked about. What does that tell you? It tells you that the net asset value is probably uh, 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 999 and a half. Okay? That's telling where the, where the value lies right now. And then you see the, the, the market, the depth of the book says, well, oh, I don't know why that moves, right? Is that uh, dealer 9 is there with 1,500 shares at 998. Dealer 7 is there at 300. Dealer 80 comes in again when they've got 10,000 more at 997. Dealer 2 is also there with 800 at 997. Dealer 80 is back with 10,000 more at 996. So what they're saying is this is our second, this is the depth of the second. Um, but what you're likely to see is that that, 10,000 shares at 998. Uh, 
you will refresh. If someone were to hit that order and buy and sell those 10,000 shares, it would automatically roll over, assuming the stocks haven't priced any differently. You know, the 60 names haven't changed in price. So there'll be 10,000 more shares available at 998, and there's still 10,000 at 997 and 10,000 at 996. And you see that this carries on on the other side, uh, everything with the prices at 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005. So this is something, and I'll come back to it later, but it's really important that this is why uh, one of the key tenets of ETF investing is that you use limit orders. And your limit order allows you to define the price at which you're willing to buy or sell the ETF. Uh, because what could happen is you had a market order out there and for some reason something happened and uh, you said you wanted to sell at whatever the market was at, then if all those 998s got taken up, got uh, got filled, and then the 997s got filled, the 996s, you could be on the hook selling at 995, even though you're pretty sure the value is 999 and a half right now. So that's why it's really you just always want to use a limit order because it helps eliminate the remote possibility of you getting uh, a fill that's not optimal from your perspective. So I've talked about this. A, a little bit already, but it's a, this is the most important question we get as an ETF company. We're almost 10 years old, um, and this is the question that's come up every week in the last nine and a half years, since we've nine and three quarter years that we've been around. Is I don't see enough liquidity on this screen. Here's all the offers here. I'm worried that you know if I have 10,000 shares and this thing only trades 10,000 shares a day, or I have 50,000 shares that trades 10,000 shares a day, I'm going to move the price. What this shows you is that the market makers are there to say that the value of the ETF and the price will always be the same because they can come back by buying or selling the underlying stocks. And this, this is a concern in stocks because when a stock only trades 10,000 shares a day and you're selling 50,000 shares, well, the first day if you're able to sell 10,000, it tells the market that, that people are selling as a net sell so the price is likely to go down, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Every time you sell, the price drops further. So you sell and sell and sell into a falling market. With an ETF, because it's priced from multiple underlyings that has a ton of liquidity, right? It, the ETF may only trade 10,000 shares a day, and those 10,000 shares could equal $100,000, but the underlying liquidity could be $100 million. So you could trade 1,000 times that daily volume without even moving the market. So really important to understand that ETF liquidity comes from the liquidity of the underlying. And the market makers create and maintain that liquidity through subscriptions and redemptions to and from the ETF company, meaning they're open-ended. And then what you want to do is research the market depth and the size of the ETFs on the bid and the offer. Uh, how big is the underlying market? TSX 60 is huge. Uh, Canadian high-yield bonds would be smaller, uh, just to keep consistent with the, uh, with the examples I've used so far. So then you determine where there's a sizable bid or offer, and that's where you can likely transact. You want to look and say, okay, where's the bid, where's the offer? The midpoint, at or near the midpoint should be the NAV. Am I willing to pay that to transact? And that's where, that's the, sort of the fundamental process you can go through. What we want to show you here is an example of a $50 million institutional order into HXT, which is our uh, TSX 50 ETF uh, offered at three basis points. Uh, after a four basis point rebate. So that, what that means, you invest $100, we charge you three cents a year to own this ETF. Well, an institution decides that it likes that, along with the tax uh, uh, efficiency that the ETF provides, as well as the, the tax structure that this specific ETF has that's advantageous. And what you can see here, and there, there used to be circles, so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm on the left side of the screen, and look at the price. There's all 2888s here. And what you see is the size of the trades here, you see 4,700 shares, uh, almost 12,000 shares, 4,700 more shares, 20,000 shares, 20,000 shares, all transacting at 1259.56. So this is all happening in the same second. This institution came to the market, put in a $50 million buy order onto HXT, and it was filled through a number of different houses buying it for them. You can see the house numbers over in BBK in the column that says so 79.80. Uh, one is doing for them, uh, 39 is per transaction from here. You can see that they fill uh, at this number uh, at 28.88 a share, uh, means that they're doing somewhere around uh, 180,000 shares to make that a 50, uh, close to a $50 million offer, uh, order. All filled at the same second through a variety of 
variety of dealers, I beg your pardon, for a single buyer. So this is this is what the market what a market book can look like. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, nineteen trades transacted. A grand sum total of nineteen trades on the same ETF at on the exact same second for a single buyer through a bunch of different buying dealers on their behalf. So we talked about liquidity. You might say, oh wow, the, the HXT trades five hundred thousand shares a day. And, Thirty dollars a unit. That's you know it's uh, one point five to fifteen million dollars a day. Well, here here you're trading three times, three plus times the daily volume in dollars in one second. So this is what we're talking about. When we say is the, the liquidity comes from the underlying, not from what's actually posted on the bid ask spread. When you're looking at ETFs, liquidity of stocks is different, and I'll leave that to someone else to talk about. But this is liquidity of, of an ETF. So some important ETF trading tips in terms of execution for you, and I, I just spoke to this a couple of minutes ago, but it's number one on here is always use a limit order. The market maker's function is to ensure that the bid ask prices for the ETF track closely to the NAV of the trading day so that all the buy and sell orders can be executed efficiently. Look, we want you to have the best experience possible. So does Scotia iTrade. The market maker's job is to make sure you have the best uh, experience possible, understanding that there are, there are costs to trading intraday. Sometimes mistakes happen. Uh, we see things like a data feed goes down. Uh, it's happened in, in, uh, on the TMX before. Uh, or say a, a market maker's data feed goes down. National Bank, for example, or in Montreal. The Montreal data feed could go down while the Toronto data feed is, is fine. So by using a limit order, you can specify the price for buying or selling the units to shares and limit the length of the time the order is valid before, before it's canceled. So really just helps you execute where you want to execute. And if the market moves and you need to move your limit, I think it's important to hear that you know, we're talking about pennies, but if, if you're missing everything by a penny, maybe you want to consider broadening out your perspective in terms of what you uh, are willing to pay. Secondly, uh, typically you avoid trading in the, in the first and last 10 minutes of the trading day. Uh, I alluded to this when I talked about gold as an example earlier. So when the market opens, it may take a few minutes for some of the underlying securities to begin trading and have their value reflected in the price of the ETF. Uh, or gold may have, in the case of gold versus stock, gold may have jumped significantly in the hour and a half before the, or hour and 50 minutes before the ETF market opens, and thus it's going to jump very quickly in price. You can try and take advantage of that, but it's often very difficult. And at the end of the day, the market maker that keeps an ETF value in line with the NAV may be exiting the market as it's executing its own closing transactions, meaning it's changing its hedges at that very end of the day to deal with its, its net changes in, in, uh, in inventory. And so what you typically see is in the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes of each trading day, your bid-ask spreads are a little bit wider than they are during the rest of the day, the, the course, the course of, the tr of the normal trading day. So a couple things to consider. Uh, third, this goes back to the gold example again, is try to execute ETFs when it trades when the underlying market is open. Uh, and I mentioned this commodity and currency markets open and close at different times in the North American equity markets, which are 9.30 to 4 uh, Eastern Standard Time. But a nice thing is that when you're in doubt, you can contact the ETF provider. And I'm not just talking about us at Horizon. Any one of our uh, peer companies in the ETF space in Canada will take your phone call and answer questions about the bid-ask spread and then help you ensure that you're getting the, the right fill. We actually do, for uh, larger orders, we, may, we can arrange for a, and this is common in the, in the ETF space, uh, say something trades 20,000 shares a day, but you have an institutional order that wants to uh, trade 100,000 shares right now, like that uh, HXT order that I showed you, the $50 million order earlier, you can just call up. Uh, this is what institutions do. Now, for us, you, you need to be trading more than a quarter million dollars. But you can call us and we will we'll say, okay, it's, it's 1 o'clock now. The market maker says the, the value of the unit is 1022. They'll be there to sell it to you at 1023 for the 100,000 shares you want in five seconds. So you put in your order, the market maker meets you. Uh, so there are all sorts of things that ETF providers can do besides being consultative. They can actually help you uh, execute. So now we have a little bit about when to buy and sell, and this is obviously everyone has their own uh, reasons. But one of the nice things about ETFs is that they see you know, the majority or lots of ETFs seek to replicate an index. So technical analysis and charting it can be is very popular to be used to identify buy and sell signals in the index. 
Uh, for example, I know Scotia I Trade used Recognia. So that's some great software to give you technical analysis on ETF. And this technical analysis tracks the price movement of the ETF to identify positive or negative pricing trends. And when combined with other types of investment analytics, such as fundamental valuation or macroeconomic analysis, it can be a powerful tool to determine whether it's a good time to buy or sell a certain ETF. Uh, an example of, of this is, is, is very uh, popular is what's called point figure charting. Uh, and this is a chart that plots the day-to-day -day price movements without taking into consideration the passage of time. So it's just saying here's what the price is doing, here's the price movement regardless of whether it's in the last 10 minutes or the last 10 years. And these point figure charts are composed of a number of columns of stacked X's or O's. And the X's are used to illustrate a rising price while O's represent a falling price. There are several uh, key point figure chart providers. Uh, the most famous globally would be Dorsey Wright, they're the big name in the U.S. But Canada's own SIA charts out of Calgary uh, give great Canadian uh, point figure charting uh, to help you determine uh, the relative strength uh, of uh, certain ETFs versus others. Then you can look at uh, you know, traditional, almost seasonal periods. Uh, I think we've, we've, many of us will have heard the phrase, you sell in May and go away, or buy when it snows and sell when it goes. Well, this is an example of that. Here what you have is the unfavorable months, uh, which is, uh, the, well, the favorable months for the S&P 500 are typically from October 28th, so Halloween, to the beginning of May. And the unfavorable part is May to the end of October. I, mean, I think we're, many of you may have heard that September is typically the worst month for performance in equity markets. So what this shows is what you do in, in the unfavorable six months here, uh, starting in 2008, is those six months are down 39.7. The favorable months are up 6.5. Here we go, we got more of a bounce. The unfavorable months are up 17.7. Then the favorable months are up 9.6, and the unfavorable are up 1.8. Then we see 12.9 versus minus 3.8. 6.6 versus, versus 3.1. So, yeah, and here's, here's one example where actually the favorable month did less well than the unfavorable month. But this is a, another source of uh, technical analysis that you can use to say, Hey, how do I want to time my, my trades? What do I look at? What are the various inputs that I have? Well, there's tech, traditional technical analysis, there's point and figure, and there's this sort of favorable, unfavorable, broader performance period. Uh, and the data on this, we show 2008, 2016, but this goes back to the 1970s, uh, or sorry, beyond, it goes back to the 1910s, which shows these periods uh, of different performance, yet still have consistency in terms of favorable six-month periods versus unfavorable uh, periods within the calendar year. Cool. So here's uh, just an, another chart that summates the uh, S&P large gains and losses during favorable and unfavorable seasons. So over the last 62 years, the favorable period for the S&P 500 has had grain, gains greater than 10% 26 times and losses greater than 10% only two times. The unfavorable period has had gains greater than 10% eight times and losses greater than 10% eight times. Let's just give you a, a broader picture of how, can, how this has worked uh, over uh, 62 years. So it's quite compelling. So I beg your pardon. So to bring it to our conclusion, we always talk about ETF strategies for every investor, but ETFs have made it possible for every investor, regardless of their experience or portfolio size, to access uh, many different types of strategies. Uh, the, keep in mind the benefits of using the ETF are you have lower management fees and comparable strategies. Uh, they're transparent, they're cost effective, highly liquid, that intraday liquidity through the exchange listing that the market makers that I've talked exhaustively about today and the role that they play in that space. You typically have no accreditation required or minimum holding period uh, like you can have with mutual funds. Um, the ETFs are relatively tax efficient and they have no minimum investment. Although I would suggest that even at the low, low cost of 990 or 999 trade that Scotia I trade provide, buying a, a $10 unit for 999 is not a great idea. So you want to look at where you can transact, uh, what's a reasonable price. I think if you look at Dan Bordelotti, who writes for Money Sense, it's a Canadian couch potato, says your ETF transactions should be uh, at minimum three or $4,000. If you have smaller than that, then you're, you're the, the cost of the execution is probably uh, outweighs the benefit of the lower management fee. Considerations to keep in mind that, of course, the ETFs can be traded only while the stock exchange is open and that they're subject to these brokerage trading commissions, even at the low, low cost of $9.99. So with that,
me to two slides. One, this is our website. Um, I showed our website. I, what I want to show you here is that there, up at the top, there's a little tab that says Contact Us. You can hit that tab at any time if you have questions about ETF trading and execution. And you can either email us and hear back from us within four business hours or call us and likely get through one of our, the members of our uh, uh, team to help walk you through uh, what you need to know about making any trades. Uh, that's the importance of this slide for you as well. Is that there's a lot of resources on our website, but uh, I'm not here to pitch that to you. I'm here to educate you on, on how to get best trading. And of course, our lawyers who want me to reiterate that this is an educational pr uh, presentation and uh, we paid them a lot of money to put this on here. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. I hope this has been useful. Uh, if we can take anything away from it, I think yeah, I know you're going to get a copy of this slide afterwards, of this presentation afterwards. This is the thing to consider. People often say, oh, well, this one's got a wide bid-out spread, this one doesn't. This is how the bid-offer spread works on an ETF. The bid-offer of the underlying, the trading costs that imposed by the by whatever exchange we're trading on, and then the market makers spread. So with that, uh, Rose, it's, I, I see we're done it in, in about 45 minutes, which is always my target. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I don't see any in the in the question box, so, but I'm happy to take any that come along. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jamie. So you can access the webinar recordings on our website from next week on. And don't forget to fill out the survey that pops up after you exit today's session. So please fill that out so that we can better meet your needs. And also mark your calendars this Thursday, September 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We are presenting on Experience Scotia iTrade's Flight Desk. And Horizons ETS joins us again on Tuesday, October 11th to present on income investing using ETFs, sources of income and yield. And we are also offering two French webinars uh, this September. One is our How to Get Started with Scotia iTrade on Friday, September 23rd. And Horizons ETFs joins us again to present in French ETFs 101. And you can sign up for other webinars on our seminar and webinar calendar under the Learn and Do More section of scotiaitrade.com. As well, past webinars can be located on that webinars on demand page. And if there are no more questions, thank you so much, Jamie, for joining us and sharing your insights. And thank you all for joining us and attending today's webinar. If you can think of any other questions, feel free to send them along to education at scotiaitrade.com. Or if you have any other questions regarding service, contact us at service at scotiaitrade.com as well. Hope you have an excellent day. Take care. Goodbye.